Hello, welcome to another episode of the Cool Tools Show and Tell. Our special guest this week is Matt Candler. Hey, Matt, would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners and watchers? Yeah, I would love to, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Matt Candler. I live in New Orleans, Louisiana. I've been designing schools and learning tools for 25 years, and I've been building electric motorcycles for 15 years. Wow, an early adopter, electric motorcycles. What is the difference between an e-bike and electric motorcycle? That's a great question. Um, so there are three types of e-bikes in the United States, and they're generally um, based on how fast that bike can go and whether you can pedal it or just use the throttle. So up to 28 miles an hour if you're pedaling is what we call a class three, uh, up to 20 miles an hour, which we'll talk a little bit about this bike behind me. For folks who are listening, the Jackrabbit e-bike is one of my four tools. We'll talk about that in a second. And then motorcycles and mopeds are faster. They generally require uh, the manufacturer to have a vehicle identification number, a VIN, and you usually need a license and insurance to ride them. But you know that there's a very gray area that I and a lot of bike and motorcycle builders constantly navigate. Uh, I find myself getting more and more interested in e-bikes and less interested in motorcycles, primarily because of that regulating uh, the regulatory and insurance hurdle. Yeah, and then you know, uh, around here we've got the mountain bikers, and right. they're slowly accepting the e-bike um, option, and they are incredibly powerful. I mean, you know, because yeah. they're they're going uphill and uh, pretty rough high torque but nonetheless um um i'm an e-bike fanatic meaning that um i believe they can change the nature of biking and they have so we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to your bike so what's yeah. your first tool all right my first tool is the makita 9032 this is a power uh, corded so if you're just listening this is classic makita green <laughs> and it looks a little bit like uh, a ray gun from star wars yeah it does uh, but instead of a barrel it's got a 21 inch uh, diameter so it's about a foot long 10 and a half inch sanding um wand and there's a 3 8 inch wide um band uh sanding uh belt on it and I saw this in a sizzle reel on the Wheeler Dealers TV show about 10 years ago. And A, it was like really cool because it made not, lots of really neat sparks. But yeah. this is my most reliable get into an uh, old bicycle or motorcycle typically that I am converting from gas to electric. Uh. This thing gets anywhere. It can clean up any weld that is, you know, mine and messy. It's got a really nice diameter here that makes um. a crappy weld that I might uh, put on a bike look nice and clean and like a stack of dimes that's just been easily shaved off. Something I learned, Kevin, getting ready for this, I didn't realize this, but you can replace this wand with a quarter inch or a half inch wide belt uh, and use the oh. same body. Love this thing, variable speed from 980 uh, feet per minute to almost 6,000. Wow. Absolutely love this. You can also, it's adjustable, so 100 degrees right. of rotation. You can oh. get in there or you can stand it up 90 degrees, clamp it to the table, You've got just a magnificent sanding yeah. uh, tool for the desktop. So what, you this. Were, what you were doing was you were pivoting the handle. So it went from kind of a straight thing to a 90 degree. Right. Yeah. So you can like get the ray gun with 90 right, degrees right. from the handle to the barrel, or you can straighten it out and they're right, right. even. And that just gives you so much flexibility. It's This is definitely one of those tools that I get excited when I you right. know have to use it. So, um, so yeah, it's it's a it's a corded version. It does look like a big gun. Um, several questions. One is, um, does any other make does any other uh, the tool makers make their version of this? And That's a great question. Uh -huh. I'm I am all in on the Makita 18 volt battery system. So there's no reason I wouldn't use a corded version. Sure. I believe uh, that Milwaukee and Dewalt have versions of this. Um, and the three eighths uh, by twenty one is a fairly standard uh, belt, so I do okay. believe that other folks make it. And what is the the generic name for the tool? 
Um, folks generally refer to it at, by the name of the, the size of the belt. So a three eighths by 21 inch belt sander is what Makita calls okay. this. And it's $215 when they sell it. So it's, it's a belt sander that's so thin that you can put a handle. Exactly. On it. It's three pounds. You can carry it, put it anywhere you want. It's exactly right. It's just like the old belt sanders that we used to have that are four inches wide and really right. heavy and, you know, need two hands. I can navigate this with a hand and and really what what i what made me really fired up about this tool is when i uh take an old classic gasoline yeah. motorcycle frame i strip everything off of it and get it down to bare metal and clean it up and there's so many nooks and crannies in those frames mm. that i can't get e even with you know a piece of sandpaper in my hand and this is just a remarkable tool the variable speed means that i can you know either just clean paint off or i can ground down grind down a weld or even you know, I find myself if I'm trying to, you know, get a perfect size bolt for a project, I can, you know, get that last millimeter or two exactly where I want it. Uh, the nice thing about it too, Kevin, is you got, you know, the rounded on the edge. And then if, uh, for those that aren't uh, watching, there's a couple of flat parts on the barrel mm. that have some nice resistance that you can push into if you're sanding something flat. And then there's other parts of the belt that have uh, less material between them and they flex a little bit and you can mm -hmm. get a little bit of a concave mm -hmm. and a convex uh, right. sanding surface. And um, since everything else in the shop is going cordless, um, what about cordless versions? They just came out with a cordless version of this. Okay. I believe it's a little bit closer to 300. Sure, sure. And um, now I might have to get the cordless <laughs> one because it's... <laughs> It's again, I'm, I, I don't know whether to thank you or blame you, but yes, what a uh, I do believe that they have an 18 volt version. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you're buying it new, you, you might consider the cordless. Oh, I, yeah, definitely go 18. And you know, with Makita, like with some of the other manufacturers, they're now offering a 40 volt system. I think that their, their version of the, this is one of those tools that is perfectly fine for 18 volts. And I wouldn't want to go up to the 40 volts yeah. on it anyway, it just adds weight. And right, right. Yeah, no, that transformation uh, myself, I've had perfectly serviceable tools that are cordless that I'm looking over. <laughs> the, oh, I mean, sure. they're corded and then I'm looking over the cordless versions just because they're cordless. And it's like, mm, I don't know, but man, it's so tempting. Yeah. yeah, it's a great one. It's it's a it's a great one. And uh, this is one of those that, you know, there's something about the corded reliability here, too. That I find myself leaving it on the bench more and more like in that vertical position, just with a clamp on the handle. Uh -huh. It's got a really accessible variable speed mm -hmm. adjustment and I can clamp something down. It has a, you know, like most of their tools, it's got a um, power lock, uh, uh, you know, I can lock and let go, and, which is really nice too. And then it's, and I can just set it wherever I want. So now I've got something that's, you know, I can apply pressure to, but um, I can still pick it up and work on something that's not on the bench. That's a great find. Thank you, Matt. That's yeah. fantastic. The, um, super narrow belt sander. Yeah. Um, so what's your second one? All right. My second one. Um, and if you're, if you're watching the video over this shoulder, over my left shoulder is an example of a electric motorcycle that I built using that tool. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that later, but over my other shoulder, um, is a very, fun uh, arguably the most fun i've had on an e-bike in years kevin this is called the jack rabbit e-bike so this is really unique the founder of the company who i've met and gotten to know um, was a former executive at qualcomm and really very well versed in um, small batteries and so there's lots of very interesting design decisions on this bike and the reason i love this bike so much is because of where i keep it all of my other e-bikes I keep here in the shop. They're charged here, they're worked on here. I actually keep this in the back of my electric pickup truck and it is always charging and it's dry and it's always safe and ready to go. And, you know, as we start to think about transitioning to electric vehicles, what I love about this bike is that the designers thought carefully about where this bike might be um, when it's not being used. And so sure. you can fold, if you notice, um, think about a, a traditional um, pedal bicycle, but shrink it down by about 60%. And we've got 20 inch uh, knobby tires. We've got a rectangular frame in the middle. We've got a regular seat and regular bars, um, but no pedals. So this is classified as a class two scooter 
uh, because it's limited to 20 miles an hour. So instead of pedals, you have two very small pegs, which you can put your feet on and they fold up. And when those fold up, you can also spin the handlebars and um, they spin 90 degrees. And then when you fold up the pegs, you've got seven inches wide of a bike. And then you can also spin, I'm taking the fork, the front fork and the front wheel, and I'm spinning it 180 degrees, and then it clips and locks. And now I've got something so compact that I can fit it behind the seats of any sedan, any four-door car, you can carry this, almost any trunk and uh -huh. a decent-sized American car. And in my case, it lies flat in the back of my Rivian electric pickup truck, right. which means it's always ready to go. And, you know, there's just something about a bike um, that is out in my driveway at that same spot where I walk to get in my car um, that changes my relationship with it because I can decide in my driveway, right. what is the trip I'm about to take in which vehicle makes the most sense? And um, so it's almost like a folding e-bike. It's such a clever design, you know, yeah. And, you know, I don't know if you, you know, have had any folding my experience with folding e-bikes is they're typically a very large um you know pivoting hinge in the middle of the frame requires a fair amount of force to unlock you've got to swing 20 to 30 pounds of bike around it closes down to maybe 15 or 20 inches but you know they made this really clever decision to say you know if we get rid of the pedals and if we fold these pegs up we're down to seven inches you know it's almost half as um narrow or twice as narrow as a traditional quote folding bike. And you know, you mentioned the mountain bikes. I was at CES uh, in January. There are so many quote folding mountain bikes that weigh, <laughs> you know, 70, 80 pounds. Yeah. They fold. Well, that's the but, other question I had about the jack, yeah. what, what does it weigh? I mean, that's my issue with a lot 24 of 24 pounds. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's because, so what kind of a battery does it? Yeah, let me show you real quick. I'll, I'll get the battery yeah. out. Just this is kind of a good demonstration. So I've, I carry just a small uh, key here uh -huh. and that goes in here. Turn it 90. Oh, okay. and that's the battery. Wow. And so I have a backup battery carry in the backpack if I want. Get about 10 miles per charge. And, you know, since I have a, a electric car, I have the charger and the backup battery yeah. always charging. And then I just swap these out. It's that easy. And yeah. so, you know, I've got 20 miles of bike with carrying this in my bag yeah, yeah, and yeah. having the other one in the bike. That's cool. And and that's yeah. no pedaling at all. That's not pedal assist. That's just correct. No pedaling at all. That's just straight. Yep. 20 miles an hour. And you know, that's plenty, you know, oh, I don't, I, I don't go to more than 20 miles for, sure. for nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's really, so, so, um, I don't have it to show off, but I had a, a e-bike. My first e-bike actually had, it was a small motor, only 250 watt motor that was inside the seat stem. Wow. Right above the crankshaft. Mm -hmm. It was concealed basically. And there was a little battery that hang, hung off the back of the seat. And it was, I mean, wasn't that much power it was just enough it was a touring bike yeah so it was just enough to kind of take the edge off going up a hill yep yep um but it was very very clever because you could look at that bike and it would look like a normal bike and it was no heavier really yeah that's so, very small it sounds like you can't get much motor in that space so it must no, be no, small can't, right yeah um, yeah so what kind of a motor does does this one have 300 watt motor in the is, it, is it on the back hub it's a rear hub yep yeah yep it's a little bit hard to see i got the light out so you can kind of get a sense of it's just a little tiny 300 watt oh it's a 300 watt okay yeah 300 yeah 300 watt uh, rear hub so um yeah yeah so that's, that's just enough to kind of move you along it's just enough yeah and i'm and i'm fortunate i you know i used to live in san francisco i live in in new orleans now flat as a pancake so um it's the perfect bike for new orleans yeah you know? yeah do you track what I'm still looking for that I haven't seen is really good touring e-bikes, um, particularly, it, you know, having to recharge them or, you know, you want to be able to get out a whole day. You want, you mm -hmm. want to get basically, you know, 60 miles at least of some, of some assistance. Um, you don't need the whole way of motor scootering. Right. Are you tracking those kinds of things? 
I am. And, uh, you know, it, th this is, this sort of talks a little bit about what we'll talk about on my project, but, um, what, it'd be really fun to talk through with you. I think, you know, as we look at, um, specialized and track and some of the larger shops as they are starting to get their dealer networks on board, they're leaning into that space quite a bit because they've, you know, I think gravel bikes in particular have been so popular um, that we're finally starting to see the first few electric uh, gravel bikes. I can't remember which models I could do a little homework for you and I'll definitely, mm -hmm. um, you know, send you some leads, but you know, that's actually what this, my next electric course, which I'll talk about in a second is, is, you know, creating a space where you come and whatever the thing in your personal fleet or in your home that you're thinking about electrifying uh, next, we talk through that and you meet other folks who are in that same boat and then share ideas. And then I go and hunt down ideas for you and okay. then bring you some, some well, things to try. Let's talk about that tool then that we, which you were just describing, right? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, um, so well, I guess maybe we, let's just complete the, the Jack. Thing. Yeah, we'll, so, yeah, we'll do, we'll get there. So, um, so what is it, what does it run? Um, and, um, so this runs nine ninety nine. Okay. Um, I was so in love with this bike that we, again, when we get back to my next electric, this is one of uh, the products that, um, I've actually worked with this manufacturer. If folks who go through my class can get a discount on this bike. And then they also give me a kickback for that. And then I split that 50, 50 with anyone in my class. It's like a commitment of mine. If I ever make money, you know, yeah. by su suggesting something, I always split that with my right. students. Um, so that's brings it down to like 800. I do definitely recommend the extra battery for another hundred and mm -hmm. or so. So, um, but yeah, just such a blast. And, um, it's more about what this bike represents as we start to think about blended fleets, you know, of different types of vehicles uh, that meet our needs. Um, and also sort of, ref, you know, reflect the efficiency. This right, this right. bike is 30 to 40 times more efficient than my electric uh, car, right, you right, know, and right. to the extent that I can fit it in my life when I, and make it easier right. to pick this over the car, I'm drastically improving. Right. The efficiency yeah. of getting around. So uh, a bike like this to me is is ideal for someone doing the kind of camper life. Oh, where yes. um, you could probably mount it on the back or something, where you have instant uh, access to it immediately. So you do you can go on your own, and that kind of as you're yep. suggesting, this kind of nested transportation thing. Where you know, one metaphor um, somebody referred to this as kind of like the dinghy uh, for yeah. your car uh, or the the tender for your yacht, yeah, you know, right, right, and right, it's, right. it's right. I think it is. And and I've, there's been a lot of people in Sprinter RVs and small yeah. motorhomes who right. picked these up right. and as their second vehicle. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So that's the Jack, Jack, what? Jack rabbit. Jack rabbit. Yep. E-bike. Jack rabbit e-bike. Okay. Um, <laughs> So Matt, what's tell us a little bit more about your third tool that you? All right, my third tool. I'm going to go to screen share, and I'm going to describe another tool for electrifying your life. So this is a product called the Neo Charge Smart Splitter. Can you and describe what it I'm, looks like and what we're seeing? Yeah, so I'm already I'm already on screen share. So um, if if you can't see me. Imagine uh, when you are plugging things into your wall outlet and you don't have enough outlets and you go to the store and you buy a three-in-one adapter and that allows you to plug three things into one outlet. This is that exact same concept, but for instead of 110 and 20 volt outlet in your wall, this is for the 200 to, 40, 200 to 20 to 40 volt um, outlet where your dryer is in either your garage or in your um, dryer room, your washing dryer room. And what what's so clever about this is it, it's really that simple. So if you just close your eyes and think about there is a prong that goes into the big 240 volt outlet. And then there are two additional prongs uh, or, or receptacles that you can plug two 240 volt appliances into. So if you're watching the video, I can click to the, um, and you can choose which, if you're not familiar with 240 volts, there's about five different types of plugs that we can use for a 240 volt appliance based on the amperage and the current that goes through that outlet. So I'm showing on the screen now, an example where I would have two 
Um, NEMA 1030, these represent the, the amps that can go through and the shape of the plug. I can also go all the way up to NEMA 1050s, which are much more, uh, there's a, sorry, a 1450s, even more powerful. I can um, essentially go from one to two of these. And here's what's really neat about this appliance. Um, let's say it's not gonna work for everyone, but let's say you have a washer and dryer in your garage or somewhere near the outside of your house. If you plug this into that outlet, you plug the dryer back into one side and then you plug your car charger into the other. And the electronics within this, it's not just the dumb box, it's actually smart enough to know which appliance is calling for current. So let's say you're washing your clothes and your dryer's running and cranking away and you plug your car in and the car says, I'd like to charge. Well, it knows that um, I'm gonna let the dryer finish and then I'll charge the car. Um, and then when you're charging the car, it will keep enough current going back to the dryers, say the dryer's not working, but there's still enough current delivered to that appliance to keep it on so that the panel is on, the power is on. And if you go in there and say, man, I gotta dry my sweatshirt before I go to dinner, um, it will sense that you wanna use the dryer just by pressing the buttons on your dryer and then it will pause the charger and then it will let you dry your clothes. And as soon as it's done, it will go back to charging. And you know what I love about this, Kevin, is, is it gives uh, us an opportunity to start adding smart 240 volt um, architecture into our house without the really heavy costs of calling an electrician in and rewiring new boxes all over the place. So, so just to um, a lot of the people know, so, so this is mostly about charging electric cars, which prefer to be charged in 240 volts rather than your 110. Yes. And those, those that traditionally in most American homes, we have a limited number of outlets that serve 240. Usually it's for your laundry and that's about it. Maybe your furnace or something. So, yep. so um, for most people, there are scarcity. There may, you may only have one 240 plug in your entire house. That's right. Yet you're trying to run your laundry and your car over. And so this is a way to smartly um, serve up serve both at once although that's exactly right um most people probably don't need to do both at once but you could right. and um and as we have if you have more vehicles more electric vehicles in your life because most people have more than one vehicle that's also a way that you're going to have to kind of exactly uh, right um, and that's really where this device will come in really handy is if you do spend the money to build that 240 volt you know out in the garage two car chargers plugged in uh, and of course, you can also program this to make sure that your time of use. So in North Carolina, where, where I am in Louisiana, we don't have time of use rates, but you do where you live and you can program it to only charge when the rates are lowest, mm -hmm. uh, which is really handy. If the, most of car, most EVs have that on board. Um, I use it actually to, um, I have two 240 volt welders back here. I have a MIG welder and a TIG welder and I can plug both. This is the first time I've been able to have those plugged in. I can uh, share the same 240 volt outlet with my two welders. Perfect uh, example of how that works. At and least so in the, my shop. The, the little black box is actually literally is a black box. How big is that box? That's about a uh, six inches square and about right. a two inches deep. And all those other, all the different receptacle, all the different um, modes, the different 240 mm -hmm. um, I receptacle know. shapes. Yep. Shapes. Are they all kind of options that you plug in and out or do you have to specify that when you order it? Click it on the website and then it'll come to you with those already built in. I see. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I was a little confused by the variety of different 240 shapes. It's a yeah. pain. I don't understand why they don't, you know, standardize on something because it's, um, it's yep. a pain. It's it I'm is a pain. And I, even the building this shop knew I made a mistake. You know, I had a 14, um, 30 in one spot and I, guess that a 1450 we'd write over here for a charger and you know it really is uh, unfortunate this is a great example of that you know it, you can uh make up for some of those bad wiring decisions if you don't want to swap out a receptacle which is not difficult but um it, it gets complicated fast right so yeah so as we move into electric vehicles it's becoming kind of the default right. um this is one solution although the it's not the preferred solution i think we should just have more 240 receptacles houses and garages should be built with multiple 
Definitely. varieties. You shouldn't have just one that has to serve the entire house, but it's a good interim fix um, yep. for those who are upgrading right now. The other thing I like about this, Kevin, is it's, you know, there's so few um, manufacturers thinking about renters. And this is an example of a piece of equipment that you can invest in as a renter um, and get some capacity out of and take it with you. Um, and I think the more folks we can encourage to build mm -hmm. tooling that helps folks who are in rental housing make the switch to right. electric, all the better. Right. I, I, I will. The cost on this unit that you're talking about is um, like four hundred dollars, I think. Three ninety nine if you're yeah. using a, a four, fifty or sixty amp and three. Uh, I have to say that seems high to me for yeah. electrical kind of stuff these days. Um, yep. But um, so, are there other? Alternatives? Is that there are some other alternatives. The com there's some other competitors that are in this space that they tend to have very big industrial boxes that have like a dongle that plugs in, and then you got to find a way to put that box either on the wall or on a on the ground. The price on this dropped recently. It uh, they dropped a hundred dollars. It might drop again as they scale up because as you can imagine, this this unit can get affordable if we get uh, sure. some volume behind it. But um, the other thing that I think is interesting here is uh, you avoid, you know, what can be $1,500 of electrical wiring. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, full disclosure, this is a company that I'm really, I'm, I'm investing in personally. I believe in this entrepreneur and I think he's doing a great job, uh, but it's going to be a really competitive market. A lot of folks, I want as many people building stuff for EV uh, drivers as possible because especially folks who are renting, because I think that this is such a great opportunity for more folks to access 240 you know for example let's say you're buying a used ev that can charge at 240 um you know do you want to spend two grand plus another grand for the charger for a car that cost you 20 grand um this allows you to get into that 240 charger that came with the car for example that gives you maybe 30 32 amps um and which is a much more convenient way of charging that thing up overnight you mean uh, on 110 uh, then, then 110, right. This will let you, a lot of car chargers are the, uh, that are coming from the manufacturer now are shipping with a swappable dongle. You can use, that charger will go up to 240. So you don't actually need to buy a new one. Like, you know, the, I bought my first EV in 2015 and it just came with a 110 charger, mm -hmm. but new EVs now come with one that you can just swap that last foot out, you know, from a 110 to a 240. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so Matt, tell us about your, your fourth um, tool. Cool. All right. One more screen share. Um, and this is getting a little deeper into, and, you know, into the conversation about electrifying. But uh, if you haven't heard of Rewiring America, what I'm showing Kevin now is the rewiringamerica.org Inflation Reduction Act Calculator. And the Inflation Reduction Act was a bill that was passed in August and is now slowly rolling out to provide tax credits and rebates for homeowners and drivers. And, you know, I have plugged into the calculator here. If you can't see it, I'm plugging in, just as an example, the zip code of 30342, that's Atlanta, Georgia, a household income of 50,000, joint tax filing and four people, and I hit calculate. And the calculator tells me that I can get 14,000 of federal upfront discounts. And this is really important, Kevin. These are not uh, like the traditional tax credits that you'd get for a really fancy electric car. These are point of sale rebates that come to you from the person you're buying the heat pump uh, to switch out your furnace and your air conditioner or your it's hot water heater. The, it's coming, where do you mean it's coming from? Well, so let's, let's go down and, and we'll scroll down a little bit. So, um, for this hypothetical homeowner yeah. in Atlanta, Georgia, um, the federal government will give that homeowner $4,000 in rebate money, uh, that's cash, to defray the cost of upgrading their electrical panel. To your point earlier, so we can put more than what's typically 100 amps, we can upgrade that, amp, that to a 200 amp panel so that we could charge electric cars, we could use solar, we could use uh, an electric heat pump instead of a gas furnace. So, so would you say uh, a, a rebate? So, like, um, someone decides that they want to put in two forty, say, to do a yep. car. They they're paying 
two thousand dollars to the electrician to to do it. That's so right. It's going to reimburse that two thousand dollars. They're working through how this is going to work, and it's going to either go, it's going to ideally go through that electrician. But that's exactly right. The electricians are going to get four thousand dollars of that cost uh, paid back to them um, from the government, and that's right off the top for the homeowner. Okay. And so you can see, like in in the version I'm showing here. In that example, we get $4,000 to upgrade the electrical panel, another $2,500 for the wiring, and then we can scroll down in the tax credits. Um, we can get, this homeowner will get another $1,000 tax credit uh, for to defray the cost of the electric vehicle charger, which would basically cover uh, most decent 240 volt chargers. So that would essentially be free. Um, and then there's another $600 credit um uh tax credit if you have taxable income um for the electric panel so you know this all adds up really quickly um we can go into the details here too of the electric vehicle credits um you know new credits are seventy five hundred dollars but you also get four thousand mm -hmm. dollars as a tax credit for a, a used electric they, vehicle yeah and they like the new credits are probably originating at the the auto dealer um, That's correct. So the big shift in uh, philosophy on this law was that we want, um, you know, most of those original credits went through the manufacturer. You've got to keep track. You get 200,000 and then you're, you run out. But they're trying to really change that so that at the point of sale, uh, whether it's the air conditioning company installer or the appliance uh, shop, uh, that credit is given to a low income homeowner or renter at the point of sale so that we don't have to worry about making sure that person has taxable income you know that's really sort of a trickle down strategy of saying only people with lots of taxable income get to take part in these so mm -hmm. um that's philosophically really clever i think operationally it's going to be a real challenge to get this thing working and get money to people and you say it has started or is it going to start or what is the actual starting so if we look at this list i'll i'll go back to that share uh, yeah. screen share real quickly the in the, the calculator so they're available now yeah so if you can see late 2023 is where most of these rebates are so okay. again you know the point of purchase essential cash value uh -huh. four thousand dollars off the top for your panel to eight thousand dollars off for your heat pump air conditioner slash heater because heat pumps also heat uh, right. and cool. Um, you can see those all say late 2023. And you know the IRS and DOE are all just hustling very hard to get the regulations and the you know policies in place so that by the end of this year, the rebates will be in effect. And then if we scroll down to the credits, you can see that all of the credits are available now. And then of course that's going to be, you know, off of your taxes when you pay your taxes for 2023 mm -hmm. uh this time next year. So all the credits ready to rock and all the rebates still very much kind of trying to figure out how this stuff is going to work. Okay. That's really great. Great tool and highly recommended. Um my daughter just did some weatherization and they're putting in a second um for the second electric car a second mm -hmm. charger so they'll be uh that'll be useful to them absolutely there's a lot of credits ready for ready for right now right yeah so thank you this is really great so um tell us about your your passion project your yeah I well as i said in my bio i spent 25 years helping people build schools and learning tools and 15 years building electric motorcycles mm -hmm. and I've started a new project called My Next Electric, which is the first time in a long time those two guys have gotten along. So my inner educator and my inner electrifier are really having fun working together on this project. And I'll just screen share for you, Kevin, and also try and describe it. Um, MyNextElectric.com is an online course that really gives anyone anywhere in the United States space and community to start figuring this electrification puzzle out. So I have one class called Electric Vehicles 101, and this is a 90 minute class that uh, costs $80. And you go through all of the pieces um, of 
you know, what makes an electric vehicle different than a gas vehicle? We just do just enough science and engineering so that folks can understand sort of fundamentally what's different between gas as a fuel and electricity stored in a battery as a fuel and what's different between a combustion engine and an electric engine. And the reason why that's important is because it have huge implications for how we live with these vehicles, very low maintenance costs, but higher anxiety about things like range and charging. And so it's a really safe place where anyone can come and open up about where they are on that journey. It may be you're not even on your first e-bike, you've never ridden one. It may be that you're on your second EV and you, you're about to weatherize for the third time and your house is completely electric and runs on solar. Um, what I do in the 90 minute course for EVs is get everyone up to speed on the technology. And then we, we workshop for each person in the class where they are and we make sure that they have everything they need um, knowledge wise and resource wise to take a positive step forward towards their next electric vehicle. So we figure out what it is, we figure out how it fits in. So like your electric road bike, that might be the e -bike, the, uh, the EV that you work through in the class. And there are 20 to 30 other people, sometimes 40 more, uh, and everybody's working out and there's usually a couple of other bike folks in there. And so you get to workshop that uh, in the 90 minute course. And then there's tons of cool stuff for alumni after. You say when you say workshop, you, live ninety minute Zoom call, yeah, right. But you're not talking about like a little workshop where you're making the bike or refitting. You're That's right. About, yeah, this is just an online course workshop I, in terms of figuring out, thinking, looking at spreadsheets. That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah, I'll blow this up so folks can read it. Maybe. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then there's another workshop. Again, this is three one hour sessions where we talk about vehicles and homes. Like just, you know, as I just showed you the whole electric home thing is pretty complicated. And so we create, you know, enough um, of an understanding of what's happening with the Refl Inflation Reduction Act. And then we give people uh, an opportunity to taste some of these technologies. You know, a classic example, Kevin, is the portable induction stove. You know, the $70 right. ducks top induction stove is the most popular thing in our lending library. So we have a lending library of e-bikes and induction stoves and if you live here in new orleans you can come pick them up here from my shop and if you live somewhere else we can mail it to you and you can use it for a couple of weeks and then mail it back or mail it to the next student and so what we're trying to do is just create a space for people to you know try out living electric mm -hmm. at a much much lower price point than go get a seventy thousand dollar electric vehicle sure, sure 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 yeah 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 um I'm sure you're familiar with Saul Griffith's Electrify book. Pretty much stole everything I know uh, <laughs> from Saul. And right, right. I read everything Saul writes. Right. Yeah. Including that magnificent book. Which is about the huge benefits that we can have in the world by simply electrifying what we're already doing. So not reducing necessarily what we do or change, but just electrifying it, not burning carbon instead of, uh, you know, using electrons instead of burning, burning carbon. And so um, yep. huge benefits, both to the environment and I think to, to lifestyle. So. Yeah, you know, I think that's like my middle, my, 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 when I first started teaching, I was a middle school math teacher and my inner middle school math teacher knows that, I can't uh, guilt a kid into learning algebra or geometry. Right. I need to try and explain to them the joy of, of math right. and the joy of finding it in their daily yeah. lives. And electric vehicles are just, they're magically fun. Yeah, they're um, much better. They are just better um, at so many things. Yeah, and yeah. Th there are also some realities, you know, like charging is a reality that is very different, that the extremely energy dense gasoline that we have been fortunate right, right, to right, use right. for the last 120 years, lithium iron batteries are one one hundredth the energy density. And so yeah. there is some behavior change that we need to create sure, safe spaces sure. for folks to navigate. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, we have, well, well, we got one of the cheapest American made, or well, cheapest uh, electric cars we could get happened to be a Chevy. It's small, but it was by far the best performance car I've ever driven. Sure. And even though it was just sort of a run of the mill electric car and we quickly discovered that the little habit of charging at night was 
a thousand times better than going to a gas station ever. So we just never go to a gas station. And it's yeah. like the little habit of charging at night was like so minor compared to that. And I think you mentioned, I just think Saul really deserves a lot of credit for this. He's the first like real hardcore scientist to say, you know, ultimately this is about human joy and human, you know, human life thriving and electric um, machines uh, properly designed with good charging infrastructure, you know, thoroughly engineered for our daily lives can really be better. They can, they can create opportunity they can lower costs they can lower stress they can improve our health right. um and so going through this difficult painful transition is worth it right. because it's going to be better for uh, humanity on the backside with and all the uncertainty and chaos that that will ensue as we do make that transition and i would say that transition has was not as doesn't have to be difficult and strenuous for for us it has not been it's been a fairly minor hassle very very minor and and as i said the release of other hassles have been hugely comparative so we see it as a net gain and and um uh you know moving to electric car was just yeah. that and um uh and the benefits compound don't they you yeah. know as you start to electrify more pieces of your life right the whole integration of the system starts right, right. to get better yeah, um, we're, when, we're solar here and have been for okay. many years, but we don't have the solar battery in the home, which is another big step. Yep. And that's, but that's coming. And um, the heat pump is something that we were just looking at this year. Um, we don't need air conditioning, but we do heat all year. So, um, so yeah, so, so it's little, little steps as we go along. That's right. And so, the, you know, I think so many of us, I think this, this, the devastating statistic about these appliance and vehicle decisions is that 60 to 80 percent of them, depending on the appliance, are made under duress when something breaks. Yeah. You know, and so fundamentally what the Minex Electric project about is about is to say, you might not be ready to make that swap to a heat pump yet, Kevin, but just a little investment in understanding what's your plan, who are you going to call, what model do you think about? Is there any wiring or some other work that you can do ahead of time so that when that fail happens, you're gonna make the right call and not bake in another 15 or 20 years of using a gas appliance? Yeah, you're 100 percent right. We, we we did want to wait until the the furnace went down, but it is because we don't have air conditioning mm -hmm. and the heaters in the middle of the basement, it's it's a project to to get it because it, it has to radiate. Um, yep. the heat. And so you have complexities that we don't have right now that would be introduced by the way. So, so we do have to think ahead on that. Well, listen, I, I asked Claudia for permission for this ahead of time. And I have been such a fan of your work and you have done so much for so many of us who have followed your work book. These are always with me. I'm offering, I asked her if I could do this for cool tools fans. Uh -huh. And she said, for sure. So if you go to my next electric, you get a 50% off of any of my classes, just using the uh, promotion code cool tools. Uh, okay. When you check out at Stripe, I just that's, I just want to say thank you to you because you've sure. been such a an encouragement to me and other makers. Uh, right. I'd love to participate in giving back to the community. Sure. Well, it's because of people like you that cool tools has been uh, successful as it has been. So thank you for your contribution today and before. And um, uh, it's been a joy having you and talking. I love electric stuff. So it's been a real surprise and a fabulous time. Thank you again. You bet, Kevin. I'll send you some ideas about that uh, electric road bike for sure. Oh, yeah, for sure. This year, our Cool Tools blog will be 20 years old, which means we've been posting something new every day for 20 years. It's only possible because of the very engaged and knowledgeable readers and listeners like yourself. You've kept this place going, and we are very grateful for you. With this idea of 20 years in mind, um, we decided to try an experiment this year, and I'm inviting our guests and listeners to join me on our Cool Tool Show and Tell, which is the program that you're listening to right now. So if you feel you'd make a good guest on this podcast and have four uncommon tools 
that you'd like to share with us, um, please sign up on our form on the website. And we'll see about inviting you. You must be comfortable taking on, talking on a video. And um, you need to have some tools that you can show. Um, we record on, as you know, on Zoom. We do a YouTube version, a visual video version of it, as well as an audible version. Fill out the form if you're interested and um, list your four, four cool tools and we'll see if there's a good fit. The applications aren't guaranteed in any way. Um, and we're looking at tools that are new to us and appropriate tools and um, whether the times will work for you. So um, we're really interested in hearing from people all over the world, not just in the US, although the tools have to be available online, easily available online. And um, if you are a long time listener, you kind of know what the definition of our tools are. They're very broad. They can be anything that's handy from something in the kitchen to something used to travel to a workshop to something professional that we may not know about. We're really interested in things that we don't know anything about. So um, this is an open invitation. We'll give it a try. If you think you make a good guess for this podcast, um, fill out the form. There'll be a link somewhere on our website. Um, and we look forward to, to chatting with you. Thank you.